Hi, good afternoon. Welcome all. I'm Yasmin Cesar, Chair of Emmy Noether Council at the Perimeter Institute. I'm proud to be part of a dynamic group of volunteers and contributors who champion diversity and increased representation of women in STEM, most particularly to encourage more women in physics and math as a world of new opportunities are unfolding and the call for talent is immense more than ever. We need all the brightest minds working on solving our greatest challenges and acknowledge the discoveries of women, which we haven't been able to do in the past. We're so pleased to have an audience of over 180 participating from across Canada and international locations for our first national virtual Emmy Noether Forum, The Power of Why. I'm honored to welcome our honor, the Honorable Elizabeth Downswell, who is our moderator today, and our four talented panelists. We are broadcasting live from the Mike Lazaridis Theater of Ideas at the Perimeter Institute. First, let me begin with the land acknowledgement. Perimeter Institute acknowledges that it is situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples. Perimeter Institute is located on the Haldeman Tract. After the American Revolution, the tract was granted by the British to the Six Nations of the Grand River and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation as compensation for their role in the war and for the loss of their traditional lands in the upstate New York. Of the 950,000 acres granted to the Haudenosaunee, uh, less than 5% remain Six Nations land. Only 6,100 acres remain Mississaugas of the Credit Land. We truly thank the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Neutral Peoples for hosting us on their land. Let me start talking about our speakers today. As a respected scientist and champion for advancing women in STEM and a perimeter enthusiast, we were thrilled when the honor accept, when her honor accepted our invitation to help spark a robust conversation among the women at the forefront of scientific discovery today. Together, we hope to provoke your thoughts and expand your knowledge of some of the research, training, and outreach being done at the perimeter. We aim to impart the importance of a greater diversity and representation of women in fundamental physics at a time when Canada is a global leader in driving breakthrough science. From logistics perspective, um, as you listen in, please post your questions using the Q&A button and we will stream them to our moderator for the question period. Now, without further ado, I'm pleased to now pass the conversation on to our honor, the Honorable Elizabeth Dowswell, to set the stage for four dynamic short presentations, followed by a thought-provoking conversation. Thank you so much, and good day to all of you. Welcome to those of you online. Uh, although we can't see you here in this studio, it's, uh, it's wonderful to know that you're there and that you're interested in this subject today. I'm delighted to have been asked uh, to moderate this panel uh, to be with you at this first Emmy Noether Forum today. The first reason is because the Perimeter Institute is really such a special place. It's so inspiring and for someone like me who's so curious, I always learn every time I'm here. It's also internationally recognized as a place that supports breakthroughs, both in subject matter, but also in approach. More about that later. It's also a place that's so very creative. It never stands still. It continues to reinvent itself in this fast-paced world of new scientific knowledge and technology. But the real thing that interests me is that most of my working life has been at the edge of 
science, and public policy. Finding ways in which amazing research that's done in a place like this institute can intrigue and motivate those in the policy world to actually meet societal needs. And this is certainly a time of global crisis and challenge, and we need your help. That brings me to the second reason for eagerly accepting your invitation. We absolutely need the voices and visions of women to be heard. It just doesn't make sense not to empower half of the world's population. Employing their big brains and their lived experiences and perspectives will undoubtedly deliver better outcomes for societies that are seeking resilience and sustainability. But I also know that if we're going to unleash such enormous talent, there is much unfinished business. There are barriers of accessibility, even violence, that need to be broken down. So today, we have the opportunity to hear about the curiosity, creativity, courage, and collaboration of four amazing young women. I have no doubt that just as we know the names so well of Marie Curie and uh, Donna Strickland, these are women who will also become household names in the coming years as champions for change. And I must uh, tell you a little secret. I'm really absolutely intimidated by the knowledge that each of them has. So uh, I hope that I can do justice to their presentations and draw out some of the questions that you have. You didn't come to listen to me, so let me introduce each of the panelists and ask them to help us understand both the methods and the mindsets of women who are, who are at the forefront of breakthrough science in Canada today. And we're going to start with Katie Mack. She's a theoretical astrophysicist who studies a range of questions in cosmology, the study of the universe from beginning to end, although we hope the end isn't coming very soon. She currently holds the position of the Hawking Chair in Cosmology and Science Communication at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. She carries out simultaneously research on dark matter in the early universe, and she works to make science much more accessible to the general public. She's the author of the book, The End of Everything, astrophysically speaking, and she's going to be releasing a new book very soon. Uh, all of our um, participants today have Twitter accounts. You can find them in numerous uh, public policy and social uh, media spaces. So do do take uh, take us up on that. So Katie, over to you. Let's hear what you have to say about the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor, for that introduction. For as long as I can remember, I've been driven by one thing, wanting to understand everything. I was a tinkerer as a kid, taking apart electronics and household appliances, usually putting them back together again. And over time, that curiosity extended to literally everything, the world of the universe. I read about black holes and space time and the Big Bang, and I wanted to understand all of it. So I studied physics and astrophysics, and now I work in cosmology, the study of the universe from beginning to end, from the smallest to the largest scales, the big questions. These days, I'm particularly interested in trying to understand the question of dark matter, the mysterious invisible stuff that holds galaxies together and underlies all the structure in the universe. Some of the ideas I've looked at are hypothetical particles like axions and primordial black holes, tiny black holes that might have formed in the extreme environment of the Big Bang. None of this work is what anyone would call practical. As far as I know, there's no connection between any of the things I study and any technological application. In fact, most of the time, I don't even know if the things I, exist, I study even exist. This isn't unusual in theoretical physics. Most of us are in exactly the same situation. We follow our curiosity wherever it leads, not thinking even a little bit about whether our work will have any positive economic impact or any application at all. So at this point, you might be wondering, are we all just wasting our time? Why don't we focus all this effort and brain power on something more practical, like improving navigational systems or increasing energy efficiency or making Wi-Fi work better? Why not work on the really important stuff? Well, there are two reasons. 
One is we can't. <laughs> we don't know ahead of time what directions of research will lead to major breakthroughs and which ones will be dead ends. If you talk to a Nobel laureate, more likely than not, they'll tell you they had no idea ahead of time that their work would amount to anything significant. The other reason is we probably shouldn't. So far, letting phys curious physicists engage in blue sky research with no plausible connection to applications has been astonishingly successful, leading to advances in our understanding that have revolutionized technology and society over and over again. There are countless examples. The physics underlying electricity, microelectronics, and nuclear engineering all started out with nothing more than curiosity-driven exploration, far removed from the pressing needs of the day. Einstein's work on general relativity, his theory of gravity that involved warping space-time, was so impractical at the time, it wasn't clear if it would ever be more than a curiosity that ex could explain some quirks in the orbit of Mercury. Nowadays, if GPS satellite calculations didn't factor relativity in, their location information would be inaccurate within minutes. In theoretical physics, something doesn't even have to necessarily exist to change society for the better. Those hypothetical primordial black holes I mentioned led indirectly to some of the technologies that made it possible to create the Wi-Fi you're using right now. In the 1970s, Australian astronomer John O'Sullivan was studying how primordial black holes might evaporate and explode, but worked out that those explosions would be difficult to distinguish from other cosmic radiation in the sky. So he invented a new radio signal processing method that would be able to tease them out. A couple, of days, a couple of decades later, he moved into industry and discovered that the same algorithm could solve a major problem in the early implementation of Wi-Fi technology. All of these technological breakthroughs started with scientists just following their curiosity, with nothing in mind but exploration. It really does work incredibly well. In fact, this method has proved so effective, we even teach it to our computers. One of the methods that we use most often in physics, and really all areas of science, is called the Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or MCMC. It's especially useful for problems where you have some complicated multidimensional landscape of parameters, like variables in an optimization problem, and you need to figure out which combination of parameters gives you the best answer, but you don't know ahead of time uh, where, how all the parameters might relate to one another, how it all connects to the solution. So as a simplified example, let's consider an actual landscape. Let's say you want to determine the highest point in some mountainous region, but you can't see the whole map at once, and you can only determine elevation if you're given a specific coordinates. If you're using an MCMC, the first step is to have the computer choose one spot on the landscape, check the elevation there, and then just walk around at random like a drunk person and see what happens. That really is literally how it works. Random steps in random directions with sampling at each point. We call it a random walk, and it's a process that appears all over physics, from the way molecules bounce around in a gas to how photons traverse the atmosphere of the sun. In this MCMC example, every time the sampler takes a step, if it lands at a higher elevation, you give it just a little encouragement to keep going that direction, with the idea that it's probably heading toward one of those peaks that you're looking for. The step sizes can also vary, so it can, be, so it can more carefully explore the most promising parts of the space. But importantly, those nudges are not absolute. There's still a chance that it'll go back the way it came or leap off in a different direction entirely. Otherwise, the sampler would end up sitting complacently on the top of the first hill it finds, completely oblivious to a giant mountain on the other side of the grid. As counterintuitive as this may seem, these kinds of an analysis methods based on random walks are so useful and efficient that they're employed in physics from everything to, from analyzing particle collider results to determining the properties of the universe from the background light of the Big Bang. The freedom to explore without prior knowledge or optimization is crucial to finding the best, perhaps unex unexpected, solution. Theoretical physics works in essentially the same way. Now, I don't want to imply that we're all stum stumbling around like drunk people, <laughs> but what we are doing is exploring the landscape in search of these unpredictable heights. We also get nudges when something looks particularly promising, we focus more effort there, but we always leave room for a complete change of direction, and we don't let the notion of what seems most practical now determine where our exploration leads. Imagine if Einstein had focused his effort on something more sensible, like making telegraph machines more efficient, or if Marie Curie had abandoned radioactivity and worked on effectively burning coal. They would have ended up stuck on their own little hills, entirely oblivious to the vast landscape yet to be explored. If we have seen farther, it's because those before us have been allowed the freedom to follow their curiosity 
and to find the new heights we didn't even know we were looking for. Thank you very much. I, I'm tempted to intervene with a question because sure. what frustrates you? <laughs> you know, most of us like to have a, an end goal, even a short-term goal, yeah. but you're working in something that's so unknown. You know, I, what, what excites me is learning just a little bit more toward what we're looking for, or, or even just something that's new to me. Maybe it's known to other people, but that process of constantly learning, constantly finding new things that you didn't know about, new directions to explore, that's exciting. It, it's frustrating not to know the answer, of course, and that is part of what drives me. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but it's exciting just to have the chance to explore that space. Well, that certainly resonates. I, I say in my job, I, I have the opportunity to learn every day, and what could be better than that? Exactly. Thank you, Katie. Next on to Estelle Einak. Estelle is a research scientist at the Perimeter Institute, but she's working at the intersection of quantum matter and artificial intelligence. Uh, she's a member of the Perimeter Institute Quantum Intelligence Lab. She's also the co-founder and chief technology officer of Yiyani Q. I hope I pronounced that correctly, a quantum intelligence startup. And her research aims to develop quantum-inspired algorithms to tackle real-world optimization problems using state-of-the-art machine learning techniques. I'm anxious to hear what she has to say. Thank you. Estelle. Thank you very much, Harano. I'm very um, pleased and privileged to be here today and to talk about the four C's, curiosity, creativity, collaboration, and courage. More specifically, I was asked to talk about creativity, but instead of giving a talk, <coughs> like a traditional talk, I decided to be a little bit more creative, all right? So I'm gonna package the four C's in a sketch. So please listen. I've also drawn some slides. You're going to see it in a while, and please follow. Complicated, you know. How can I solve this problem? There are just too many possibilities. Hi, Alice. How are you doing? You look pretty worried. Is everything all right? Hi, Estelle. No, everything is not all right. You know, all this money, I've been thinking about investing it in stocks, bonds, and keep crypto. But the more I think about all the possible ways I can invest this money, you know, to increase my profit and, you know, to minimize my risk, I mean, there are just too many possibilities. Hmm. I know, that's the portfolio optimization problems. That's a very hard problem to solve, you know. And, I mean, I don't want to break the bad news, but the more the size of your portfolio increases, I mean, the number of possibilities increase exponentially. Still, you're not helping me out here. Hmm. Oh yeah, of course. You can put your investment in quantum superposition. Quantum what? Quantum superposition. I know you probably think I'm crazy, but actually, quantum superposition is a pretty neat feature of nature. You know, nature at a very, very tiny scale, at the atomic scale, say for example an electron, can have many positions at once. So if you take your investment and you look at it as a quantum system, you can literally explore all the different possibilities at once. That is, putting your investment in quantum superposition. Mm. I mean, I'm not sure I quite get that quantum superposition thing. Is it similar to that cat that I used to see on memes, you know? That's kind of alive and dead. Yeah, yeah, that's the Schrodinger cat. You get the idea? Hmm. 
That's curious idea. Hmm, Esther, I don't know. But that's creative as well. Do you know how to do that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know how to do that. You know, at my startup, Yannick we build quantum intelligence algorithms to solve optimization problems in finance. And we could also ask for help from uh, my collaborators, you know, at the Pickle, the Perimeter Institute Quantum Intelligence Lab. I mean, those folks are experts in simulating quantum body physics, and they also know a bunch about actual intelligence. They sure could help. Hmm, yeah, I've heard about the Pickle. That's maybe not a bad idea. But actually, will you have time to do that? I know you are busy with research. By the way, I mean, you're a research scientist. You're also an entrepreneur. I mean, how do you find time to do both? Well, Alice, you know, it's just a matter of proper time management. Yeah, I know, but still, is it not risky for your academic career? I mean, if you want to land a permanent professorship position in the future, you know? Well, Alice, you know, nowadays there are more and more academic entrepreneurs, especially in quantum. And actually, if you want to solve the world's hardest problem and help humanity like you're having a problem right now, you need to be bold and be courageous. Yes, Estelle, that's the spirit. Let's do it. Thank you very much. That's my presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Estelle. I, I, um, I would not have thought of understanding something about quantum physics uh, would help me with my time management or my money management skills, but you never know. Sure. <laughs> Our third uh, speaker today is Zaneb Asim. She's um, an, a U of T undergraduate student in life sciences, neuroscience, and psychology and a research assistant in the uh, Emotions and Learning Optimization Lab. She's a champion for diversity and women in science and believes that girls can be astronauts too. And that's her message as the youngest future astronaut. She's making it her goal to inspire more girls to study STEM and in, in 2020 founded GIVE, the Global Initiative and Vision for Education to promote STEM and access to education. She's even been chosen by a mentor by the United Nations Space for Women Network. We've got a lot of uh, people interested in space these days with the, the newest Canadian astronaut joining, uh, uh, joining the next mission. So uh, I'm sure what you'll have to say will be of interest to people. Thank you, Your Honor, for that introduction. Um, and also some happy news. I just got promoted to uh, being a primary researcher at the lab now, so not a research assistant anymore. Um, but yes, thank you for that introduction. Um, hello again, I'm Zenab, and I'm studying neuroscience, education, and public policy at the University of Toronto um, with astrophysics as my other love. Um, but today I'll try to connect my talk to the four C's, specifically focusing on collaboration. And as a student, a neuroeducation researcher, an advocate for improving STEM education uh, for girls and women across the globe, I want to focus on the need to change our education systems to retain more women in STEM in Canada and cultivate the competencies required to address challenges of the 21st century. Ever since I was eight years old, I've been drawn to the sciences, particularly astronomy and the study of the brain. One was the universe of which we are a part, and the other, in my mind, was another universe that was a part of us, just as vast and just as unknown. This interest in science uh, began in large part due to my early education. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to a Montessori school where we weren't strictly separated by grades and so we could learn from and with our peers and where there was this environment in which we could be mini scientists, uh, ask questions, experiment without the fear of failure and lean on the diverse strengths of those around us. I would have mo constant aha moments because often a peer would say something and I'd feel, hmm, I'd never thought of a problem like that, as Estelle just demonstrated, or even thought to ask those questions. And that opportunity to collaborate deepened our understanding and love of STEM collectively. But then something changed. 
As I progressed into middle school and then secondary school, I noticed a shift in my outlook towards STEM and education itself. The wonder of science, the excitement, the curiosity became harder and harder to sustain. Instead of meaningful collaboration, the more the work became isolating. With students sitting on desks in rows, or even if we were in pods, uh, we weren't able to speak to the human beings who we shared space with. And any minimal group work we had was almost robotic, copied off a piece of paper with the outcome and the solutions and the instructions predetermined, with the goal being to get a good grade instead of to grow through the process of collaboration, of learning from each other and from our diverse perspectives. The spirit of scientific inquiry and curiosity, the purpose of this pursuit, the why of it all, became more difficult to remember and connect to. And while there was that curiosity every time I raised my hand, if the question wasn't connected to the curriculum, it didn't get um, covered. And so as a result, I wouldn't have likely chosen a path um, of STEM if it hadn't been for the foundations that had been built in my early education, some great teachers and mentors along the way, a supportive family, and really other activities that were anything but school. Not every kid has that, unfortunately, and school is the primary place for that love of learning to be fostered. And I had friends where that wasn't the case, uh, so they eventually left STEM altogether as a result of their experience in the education system and because of this idea of the lone scientist. The story isn't about me, and it's not about my peers either. It's reflective of a well-researched phenomena that we know of, the pipeline problem, and the fact that interest in STEM decreases as women go through higher levels of schooling, which is a key challenge to getting more women to choose STEM and retain them if they do choose that path. The issue with attracting women to STEM starts early on and we need to address it early on. Um, and don't worry, the rest of this talk is much more hopeful because at our lab at the University of Toronto, our work with the National Education Policy Center in the States and our student-led um, organization, the Global Initiative and Vision for Education, we're using neuroscience and education research to foster the fullest potential of the schooling system in order to foster the fullest potential of people. And we've been doing research to understand not only why this is happening, but how we can address this challenge head on to build the next generation of women in STEM to support the growth we have in Canada. And at the core of this is ensuring we have evidence-based, research-supported policies and practices that create the environments and support the conditions for learning and collaboration to happen in the classroom. And in terms of what we can do, collaboration is not only a competency needed in STEM, but also an intervention to get more women into STEM and keep them uh, interested in these fields. It starts with school because studies show that Gender differences in attitudes and interests in STEM tend to increase during secondary school or tend to um, become formed during secondary school when ideas about who we are and our identities are being formed. And so it's really a critical point in order for us to address this issue. And I'll briefly touch on three main approaches that we can take based on the research. First, it, what we teach. Two, how we teach it. And three, creating opportunities for mentorship and public and private partnerships or community school partnerships. In terms of what we teach, we need to recognize that students and the classroom are not separate from society. With studies showing how social biases, be it about gender or race, do seep into school, whether it's external or internalized bias, conscious or subconscious, implicit or explicit. I went to an all-girls school, and during my entire time there, I learned about two female scientists, both of which were white, and we somehow skipped over all the other contributions women from across the globe made to these fields. So yes, we do need curriculum reform and we need to diversify it. And at the same time, um, we need to teach skills like collaboration when we put students in those situations. So not only practicing collaboration, but giving students the tools to do that. Second, the way we teach STEM subjects needs to be transformed, meaning the systemic constraints placed on educators and their ability to employ effective pedagogies needs to be reformed so that they have the flexibility and the autonomy uh, to employ their expertise. And what pedagogies and policies do we mean? Well, a 2008 study from the National Academy of Engineering asked people if they wanted to be engineers. Girls were twice as likely as boys to say no. But when asked if they would like to design a safe water system in their community or help save the rainforest, more girls answered yes. What we need then is pedagogies that connect content to context. We need purpose-based, community-based, collaborative opportunities for learning, such as more interdisciplinary approaches, mastery-based models, project-based 
um, pedagogies which prioritize active learning and collaboration instead of passive consumption and competition. When students feel like they are a part of something greater than themselves and contributing to something greater than themselves, or simply following their own curiosity, like Katie said, we see that that makes a big difference in their motivation, their sense of longing, and their interest in pursuing STEM. And third, the need for mentorship, because really that's its own form of education, along with these public, private, and community partnerships and schools that can help bring more women into STEM. In terms of mentorship, the importance of connecting young girls to mentors is demonstrated by the fact that girls who know a woman in STEM are far more likely to say they understand the relevance of STEM, know how to pursue a STEM career, and feel empowered in pursuing a STEM career. With public-private partnerships or even partnerships with local community organizations, they are important for things like engaging in project-based learning or to allow students to collaborate in real-world settings. And there's many hopeful examples, but for the sake of time, um, we can talk about that later. So just to close off, for creativity, curiosity, and courage to be nourished and to attract and retain more women in STEM so that they can contribute and benefit from the growth in these fields in Canada, we must collaborate from researchers to academics to industry and to policymakers to prioritize collaboration in our education systems. With AI, prioritizing what makes us human, this ability to collaborate um, in order to innovate is more important than ever before, and therefore the environment, the ecosystem, and the conditions we create for learning needs to change to emphasize meaning and relevancy, community community connection, curiosity, and collaboration if we are to be competitive. And to do that, we need to invest in the next generation. So thank you. Thanks very much. I, um, I'm reminded of uh, the research that has been done, very practical research on gender differences in, in how uh, people perceive risk and, uh, and, and consequently whether or not they ask those questions. When I was doing work on uh, trying to understand what approaches we would take in Canada toward the uh, uh, high-level nuclear waste that, uh, that we were building up, uh, there was a, a public polling firm that undertook a study, and one of the surprising differences, you probably don't think it was surprising, but at the time it was, uh, when they asked men uh, about what to do with high-level nuclear waste, the response was, well, we, we got into the business of nuclear for all of the good reasons that society needed nuclear for, and we just had faith that technology would develop and we'd find an answer to what to do with the waste. And yet when they asked the women in the study uh, the same question, uh, they said, you mean we got involved in nuclear waste without knowing what we were going to do with it? It was just an entirely different approach, much as you as you just described. Um, and I think we're oblivious to some of those differences that uh, that actually do exist. Let's turn to our last uh, uh, panelist, Vanessa Vicaria. She's known as the Lady Gaga of math education. She's the founder and director of The Math Guru, a super cool boutique math and science tutoring studio in Toronto that's changing stereo stereotypes about what math education looks like. She's also the host of the Math Therapy podcast, author of the Math Hacks series for Scholastic, and lead singer, guitarist for rock band, Good Night Sunrise. She has a Bachelor of Commerce teaching degree and Master's of Math Education and appears regularly on national television and news outlets, and her goals are to be Oprah-level Oprah famous and to totally change math culture so that STEM is finally as cool as every single Taylor Swift song ever written. That's an ambitious, a bold goal. So let's, oh, I should have also mentioned that she's, she mentions that she's also failed grade 11 math twice, which was the best thing that ever happened to her. So Vanessa, over to you. Hello, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, which I wrote myself and really appreciate you reading out loud. <laughs> Okay, so I got to say, hi, everyone. It is a honor to be closing today. And Estelle, Zeneb, and Katie have said so many of things. I've just been sitting here snapping my fingers at everything they've been saying. Um, and I want to start by saying this. You know, I really think that anybody who 
has the opportunity to talk about math, to educate with regards to math or science or STEM, to parent somebody, to, to talk to a friend about these topics, has an opportunity no one else has. And I want to say why. Research has shown um, that math is one of the first things that a woman or a girl, a young person is told they can't do. And I want you to think about that for a second. At a very young age, girls are more often than not taught that math is something they are not put here on the planet to do. And what happens is when they're taught that, it is often their first limiting belief. It's the first thing they think to themselves, oh, there's something on... It's something I'm, there's something I'm just like innately incapable of doing. What else can't I do? When they're faced with obstacles, when they're faced with risk, when they're faced with challenge, when they're faced with failure, which we all are as human beings, they, they start thinking, maybe that's just something else that I can't do. So while I'm here to talk about math, um, I'm here to talk about it, yes, because we need more women to be welcomed into the folds of math and science because that's where our world is heading. But we actually need more women to walk on this planet believing they are capable of absolutely anything they set their mind to, including math. And that's where we come in. So as um, as you heard, I failed grade 11 math twice. I was in high school, very busy wanting to be a rock star and marry Keanu Reeves. Those are both still my goals to this very day. And the entire time I was failing math, I was told by my teachers and my peers, and this rings so true to what Zenab was saying, oh, Vanessa, you're just not a math person. You're just not the type of person who's good at math. People like you are more creative. You're more artsy. And I always thought, well, yeah, you don't need math skills to be in Hollywood. And I went along my merry way until I took grade 11 math for the third time. I passed with a 57 and my parents sent me to a alternative school. This was a school for misfits. We were all in an office building. We called teachers by their first names. I loved it. There were only a hundred kids in the whole school. There were no jocks. There were no cheerleaders. There were no math people. We were all just there to learn. And I walked into my grade 12 math class and I said to my math teacher, you're going to have a lot of trouble with me. I am not a math person. And she looked at me and she said, you're not a what? And I said, I'm, I'm not a math person. And she looked at me and she said the words that would forever change my life. She just said, that's not a thing. I ended up with a 98 in grade 12 math. I went to university. I got 100% in calculus. It's not about the marks. It's about the fact that I became someone who started thinking, well, if there's no such thing as a math person, when I face failure or obstacles, I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to seek out resources. I'm going to tap into everything I can around me because I innately believed that I was capable of anything. And you will be happy to know that I am in a rock band now. And three years ago, we opened for Bon Jovi. And I'm saying that because the point is there is no either or. That math teacher telling me that anything is possible, including math, is what led me to eventually start that band to work my butt off to get to where I wanted to go. And that's why I'm here today. After I was good at math, suddenly I ended up starting um, the Math Guru, which is a tutoring center devoted to changing stereotypes around math people. I did my master's degree and I wanted to learn why girls get taught this, where we get this idea that girls can't do math. My master's thesis was called Imagining a World Where Paris Hilton Loves Math. And I studied all the influences outside the classroom, all of the media that we see that we're apparently okay with, all of the advertisements that companies are allowed to put out there that show gendered stereotypes over and over again, where is it that we get this idea that girls can't do math? It happens in the classroom. It happens in the education pipeline. It happens when women get into industry, when they get into higher ed, and it happens in the world around us. And that's what we're here fighting today. Every step along the way, women are told that courage exists in STEM for the wrong reasons. They are taught that they need courage. That's my word, by the way, courage. That's that's what I've been assigned. And I'm so glad we are told that women need courage in STEM fields and in education because they have to fight their way to the top. We are constantly told we need to find a way to get women interested in STEM. We need to get them realizing they can do it. That's actually not what we need. 
Women shouldn't have to have courage to face microaggressions and sexism and discrimination every day. We shouldn't expect that of them. I wouldn't want, if I was a young person, I wouldn't want to go into a job where it's known that I have to fight my way to the top because people don't believe in me. We don't need women to get interested in STEM. They are interested in STEM. They're born interested. Babies, when they, you know, when they are born, they are constantly doing science. They're doing math. They're exploring. We don't need to get women interested. We need to hold people accountable for making women disinterested, for bullying them out of participating, for discriminating against them, for telling them they're not good enough. So today, I'm here to tell you guys that the, the reason courage is important is because through math, through science, through STEM, we can teach not only those hard skills, but we can teach women that they have it in them to be courageous in terms of taking risks, following their curiosity, putting their hand up when they don't know the answer because they're going to be treated like everyone else in the class. Yes, math and science require courage because often we're on the forefronts of things people have never discovered before. And girls are often taught to stay small and to keep quiet. We're taught that again in the classroom and outside of the classroom. So Finally, I kind of want to say, whoever you are watching, I know there's people here from such diverse audiences. There, it's a call to action. If you're an educator, can you help students? Can you help your female students and the men in the room, the boys in the room, realize there's no such thing as a math person, right? That our brains are neuroplastic, that we can all be anything we can dream, that there is no genetic component to math ability. Every few months, an article comes out trying to argue that there's a genetic gender difference in math ability. What is that, right? Can we fight that in the classroom? Can we make sure not only that our girls feel strong, but that our boys know that they, they, you know, they, there's no difference. Everyone needs to be held accountable here. If you're in industry, can you help develop and support talent inquisition, mentoring practices that empower women, not only to apply for these positions, but to feel safe and supported in taking innovative risks? And again, can you hold the, the non-female identifying members of your offices and of your corporations accountable? And if you're in media and government, can you take a stand to put restrictions on media that represents and perpetuates these harmful stereotypes? There is an ad every year where it's like the mom is making a sandwich being like, I can't help my kid with their math homework. Let dad do it. Why is that allowed? In the UK, that kind of stuff is banned. We need to do better here. Wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you do, remember that we have an opportunity not just to invest in women in STEM, but to invest in a world where women feel like they can do anything, even STEM. So I ask you, what will you do with that opportunity today? Thank you guys Thank so you much. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I love that positivity and that energy uh, that uh, we should just stop right there. But um, I, I want to uh, now, uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, some of them are coming in online. But I want, to, uh, I want to ask all of you about that word courage. You specifically referred to it, Vanessa. But have you found, uh, and I'll ask all three of you to to comment, have you have you found that you've had to develop in some way courage at some point in uh, in your work, um, either uh, perhaps uh, in the professional work that you do, but also just in your in your own lives uh, along the way? Maybe I'll start with uh, you, Zanib. Okay. Um, I I think I'm still developing that courage, but the I think the most important type of courage that I've developed is overcoming the own, my own limitations. And yes, they come from outside, like Vanessa was saying, but they're internalized and I became to believe them myself. And that's what I meant is there was a point where I really reconsidered is, is, is neuroscience for me? Am I capable of doing this? And I wasn't explicitly thinking, is it because I'm a woman, but all the ideas um, and all the people that I knew about or that I saw were all of a very particular nature. And there was no one like me that I knew about. Um, and whether or not I consciously uh, connected the dots, that was one of the reasons is that I didn't see myself in the field. I didn't see myself as a neuroscientist um, or even, you know, with my hobby of, of astrophysics, which I do as a minor. Um, and so the courage, it shouldn't be that way, but the courage that I've developed is constantly, every time that thought comes back of imposter syndrome, which we were talking about in the green room, the courage to say, you are here, you are doing it. Why are you questioning yourself? Nobody always knows what, what they're doing, but as long as you keep on trying and striving and are curious, 
you can do it and you are doing it. And so really, I think that's the most important type of courage that I've overcome. Even if people do things externally, if you don't believe in yourself. Absolutely. There's a, um, there's some wonderful, uh, quote from someone whose name I can't remember, but it's exactly, uh, of that nature. It says that the biggest barriers you often have to face are the barriers in your own mind. Uh, they're not, uh, they're not, uh, necessarily, uh, the ones you might think about. Absolutely. How about you, Estelle? Well, for me, I've actually been very fortunate because my mom has been telling me since I'm born that as a girl, I can do whatever a man can do, you know, and actually I didn't know that that would have helped me a lot in, uh, in my career, as Vanessa mentioned. I mean, I had a lot of instances, for example, during my master thesis, where basically uh, one of the questions that were asked to me, that was asked to me was, I mean, now you have a master in physics. You know, it's very difficult for a woman to get married when you have a master <laughs> in physics. I was asked that by the president of the jury in front of my parents, my classmates, my family members, everybody. But my mom prepared me. I mean, I just rub it off. I was like, whatever, you know. And when I moved further, I was doing my PhD. One of my classmates told me that, Estelle, what are you doing there doing a PhD in physics? I mean, you should be married, having two kids, be in the kitchen and cook for your husband. And please, that was a postdoc telling me that. I was very annoyed that day, but I rub it off. I remember the words of my mom. And that's the reason why we need to have mentors. I was really fortunate that was my mom, but a lot of girls out there don't have that. And it's good that those mentors can speak into the life of those young girls that you can do whatever you set your heart to do. And I think that's the point that Vanessa was making, that uh, it, it starts even before school. It starts in your home environment with people saying, you're capable or you're not. And my mom did the same thing. Uh, I think it's sometimes an immigrant story as well. Where, where you're taught you can, uh, you've come to this country to seek uh, something better and you can do anything you want to do as long as you stick at it, as long as you work hard at it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Did you have the same kind of story, Katie? Um, I'm, I certainly had a lot of encouragement uh, from, from my mom to, to pursue physics and um, you know, my family believed in me in, in my pursuits. Um, and I, I had, you know, teachers who, who believed in me. I had, um, other mentors, uh, when I was growing up who, who gave me, you know, opportunities, uh, and, and encouragement. Um, and I was thinking about the question about courage, you know, I think one of the things that, uh, that we don't talk a lot about a lot, but it, it's, it takes some courage to, to, to just try to learn something that you don't already know. I think a lot of times when people, sort of fall out of, of uh, STEM fields, it's because they, they reach a point where they have to try hard. They're no longer feeling like they're a natural at something. And, and so there's this feeling that if you, if you don't already know it, if, you're not, if it's not really easy for you, then clearly it's not for you. And, 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 it, and it's, it takes courage to, to keep pushing through that and to, to say, no, I'm going to try this, even though I might not be good at it right now. I'm going to try this, you know, even though it's going to take some effort to improve. That, that's a scary thing. It's actually quite frightening sometimes to open up a textbook and, you know, be intimidated by, by all those things. And it takes some courage to say, no, I, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to learn this. And, you know, maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't. Like, but, but to, to just take that step um, is, is sometimes quite scary, but, but it's so rewarding uh, when, you, when you do learn something, when you find that actually you don't have to be good at it already, you can become good at it um, and you can learn something and you can get that, that, those abilities, the, the, that new perspective. Um, it's just such a wonderful feeling. I think it's a common trait that, um, that uh, many people are uncomfortable with risk, mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with trying to learn something they don't know, trying to uh, take that next step as you just uh, describe it. And yet, when I think of how one links the potential of various scientific developments to something very concrete in people's lives, it's often being able to understand the risk that people are, are willing to assume. 
You can, uh, scientists can tell you what the risks are. They can tell you how to mitigate those risks with new technologies. But ultimately, you have to tap into what people's values are and, uh, and how prepared they are to take those risks. Absolutely. There are a number of questions uh, showing up on the screen. Um, one of them is a very, uh, I think, a very basic one for everyone. How can developing nations encourage girls and women to engage in science and be involved in solving problems related to new technologies? I guess one of the underlying assumptions in that question is that girls in the developing world are different than girls here in Canada, for example. And I really wonder if that's a false assumption. But maybe each of you could take a, a try at that. Do we Stel, want do you want to start? Um, yes, yeah, so why not? I mean, for me, I think it's a lot of um, education. Education um, for both the girls and the boys, you know, starting at a very, very early age, you know telling them that, I mean, you can do whatever you want to do, right? Getting the teachers telling them that, mm -hmm. getting, even educating the parents, you know, because in some, I mean, in the mentality of some parents, they will mostly encourage the girls, okay, do medicine, become a lawyer or things like that. But they will encourage the boys, I mean, you can be a physicist, you can be a mathematician and things like that. You can be an astronaut, right? But starting to tell the parents, you can tell your little girl, you can be an astronaut, you know? So really changing the perceptions of the general society. Uh, so, um, Let's ask the future astronaut <laughs> that question. I, I'll preface it by saying that, um, you know, my parents are from what we call a developing country, from Pakistan, but I grew up here and I don't want to sound like someone who's sitting here giving a solution to a problem out there because we don't know that answer. Um, and there are local communities who are doing amazing work. And so I'm going to highlight maybe one of those stories really quickly. Um, we visited a northern area of Pakistan, indeed. And uh, there was one school there for girls up until grade six, and that was it. There was no schooling after that. Um, but when we spoke to the girls there, their dreams about what they wanted to be, whether it was medicine, whether it was physics even, um, assumptions of things that, you know, people here might think they won't even know about. They have those hopes and dreams, they do. Um, and they're encouraged by their families, they're encouraged by their teachers, they're encouraged by these mentors. But then the, the issue is the opportunity isn't there. And we've exported education systems from countries that haven't faced the same challenges. And we've put those education systems there a lot through, in the case of Pakistan, British colonization. Um, and they're building these skills, assuming that the opportunities exist there to get a job um, or to be employable or in academia, um, uh, which is secure. And instead, the challenges that they face are in actually creating those opportunities. So they need more innovation and more creativity than we even do here. Um, and we're, 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 we're educating people in the same way, even though the contexts are completely different. Um, and we've seen innovations and in them being able to bring in robots and laptops to be able to help them engage in those sort of real world problems for us to build those skills. Um, so I would say, how do you um, uh, sort of get more people interested in STEM developing nations uh, give local communities more power and resources to do that because they know the problems and they have the solutions and I think we need to get, let them do what they need to do. I have time for one last question for Vanessa. Um, I'm always intrigued by those who make the link between physics and music <laughs> and you're the prime example of a person who, uh, who, uh, who draws that link for me. Uh, it seems to me that we have so much to learn from the arts, from social sciences, but particularly from music. And uh, I wonder if you've got any advice for us in that regard, Vanessa. I, I have advice, but probably not um, the kind you're thinking, because for me, a lot of people say that. They'll say, oh, there's a link between math and music. So that makes sense. And for me, I'm like, I mean, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I actually really don't know um, if that's why I'm interested in both. But to me, the links are when it comes to math adjacent skills. So for example, things like taking risks in both math and music, the number one thing when you're writing a song or when you're solving a math problem 
is creativity. It's the number one thing, right? When you're solving a math problem, you're like, okay, I have no idea how to tackle this. It's like, you know, when people talk about a flow state, like just being in the state where nothing else matters and you're just doing your thing, it's almost meditative. To me, that's what people don't realize. And, and I love how you put it. We have so much to learn from the arts. Yes, we do. Because the number one thing in the arts that I think is almost like sucked out of the STEM field is that in the arts, it is encouraged to collaborate. It's funny, actually, this ties it together. It's the four C's. In the arts, we are encouraged to collaborate with others, to songwrite with others, to perform with others, to be curious and just follow our curiosity. Who knows what kind of sound you're going to make? To be creative in your songwriting. Don't follow a structure, just like do your thing. And to be courageous. What did, I, did I miss one? Was it courageous? I think that's it. And to be courageous, to get up there on a stage, to share that energy with the audience and see what you get back. Imagine we brought that to math. Imagine we brought that to science. We That's it. Collaborating with scientists everywhere, being curious and just taking risks, even though you don't know where the answer is going to take you. You know what I mean? Being courageous and just trying something, even though you might fail, you need to do that. You need to get it wrong before you get it right. And I think that's it. I think that's really it. It's not saying like, oh, you know, in math, there's numbers and in music, there's numbers because there are skills. It's like those math adjacent skills are the skills we foster in the arts. Let's foster those same skills in STEM fields. That's wonderful. This conversation could have gone on for so long, and I'm so happy that none of you made me feel like a total nim thimble <laughs> in terms of <laughs> physics. Um, I'm one of those people who didn't take physics in high school, and the only class I ever failed at university was my my midterm in physics uh, until I got my act together and sorted it out. But uh, I know exactly uh, what uh, what you're talking about. It's been just a delight to meet all four of you. Thank you for being so open in talking about things that are really personal because you can you can learn the subject matter from any number of people. But I think sometimes young people are more influenced by hearing the personal stories from uh, from others who are doing fascinating things. And I really did mean it when I said uh, that many of your names will become household words uh, uh, in the very near future. I have no doubt at all. So thank you for allowing me to be with you. And uh, my warm congratulations to all of you for what you've been able to do, to do so far. And uh, I will look forward to uh, hearing the next chapter from each and every one of you. And now we'll turn it back to Sandra, who's going to make some closing remarks, I believe. Thank you so much. I'm Sandra Ware, a proud member of the Emmy Noter Council and the Emmy National Forum Working Group and a champion of innovation, excellence, and gender equity. We're so pleased to have had such a far-reaching engagement today. Thanks to your many questions, I believe we can look forward to more forums and inspiring chats. Your Honor, on behalf of Perimeter and the Emmy Noter Council, thank you for guiding an enlightening discussion, revealing the fundamentals of science and the four C's that foster breakthrough science. A deeper conversation has just begun. And to our panelists, you are today's formidable forces of nature, the new Emmys, Francis Elites, Madame Curies, Ada Lovelaces, whose stories we're proud to spotlight and share for all the world to know. Thank you for generously sharing your ideas, for illustrating our ability to explore and comprehend nature from the smallest to largest scales, apply knowledge and ingenuity to improve our world, for showing us the many ways we can contemplate and imagine experiment and observe, understand, design and make, for sharing the power of why and what lies behind employing curiosity, creativity, courage and collaboration, and how we can deeply probe and search for truth individually and collectively. Together, we're reshaping the world. We hope you've enjoyed the insights you've, you've generously shared today and encourage all Canadians to contribute and problem solve, especially for our listeners to come away more confident and that we can affect positive change by embracing science as the means to tackle big questions, to deal with our challenges and our opportunities for growth and innovation. The next decade will undoubtedly bring many scientific and technological discoveries that will shape our future. And to quote our chair, 
Perimeter Institute is a world leading Canadian gym, incubating discoveries through postgraduate studies and physics research in a home-like environment. Many amazing female scientists were not acknowledged for their discoveries in the past decades and centuries. Together, we're bringing exceptional female PhD students and researchers to Perimeter for their greater advancement and looking forward to a more diverse physics research community, which will drive key findings over time. So we encourage you to continue being part of the conversation. You can visit us, visit us at our website, specifically perimeterinstitute.ca forward slash ME dash noter dash initiatives, where you can access more insights from Perimeter, search podcasts, lectures, forums, and articles, and a host of rich resources that can inform and inspire. We'd also welcome you joining the circle. We invite you to become part of it and make a gift to the Emmy Noter Emerging Talent Fund. And you can do so at perimeterinstitute.ca forward slash Emmy dash Noter dash emerging dash talent dash fund dash program. And I know that's all a mouthful. We'll be sharing this after the, uh, the forum today. And you can also follow us on social media, send us your questions and stay tuned for our next Emmy forum. Thank you for being part of the equation.